and welcome into Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com. With me is the relaxed and tanned Ross Grimsley, as he is every Monday night. How are How you, you doing, Stan? I'm doing great, buddy. Doing great. And, uh, and a good friend of both of ours and somebody that we want to warmly congratulate for his selection to go into the Hall of Fame as the baseball writer this year, Tim Kirchian. And Tim, it's really a pleasure to have you on. And under these circumstances, just great, great news. Well, thank you, Ross. Thank you, Stan. Um, this has been the most overwhelming week <laughs> of my life. I can't even explain. Uh, it's the greatest professional week of my life. Tuesday was a, an experience uh, that I was told this is what you should prepare for from my friend Dan Shaughnessy and Jason Stark. And yet it was way bigger than I thought it was going to be. It has slowed down. Thank goodness since then, yeah, since really. last Tuesday. <laughs> but it is still a wonderful feeling. And I couldn't, I am so honored to just be nominated and then to win. This is it's beyond my wildest dreams. All right. Now, this whole this whole Zoom today of 30 minutes or so is meant to be a celebration of that. But part of a celebration of a base, a life in baseball, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the passing of our good friend, Roland Heeman, who was a longtime general manager of the Chicago White Sox and the Baltimore Orioles. And uh, Tim, I know you crossed paths with Roland for many years in Baltimore here. Your thoughts when you heard the passing of Roland Heeman? Well, I was deeply saddened, of course. Um, I was the beat guy for Roland's almost his entire tenure as the general manager here. When you're the beat guy, you, you speak to the general manager virtually every day. At least I did, because I was always afraid I was going to miss something. Roland's one of the best baseball guys I've ever met. He loved the game as much as anyone I've ever met. He was an absolute consummate pro on how he did his job, but he also had a really playful side to him. You remember he was the GM during the 0-21 start by the Orioles in 1988. So after like 13 in a row, he decided to try to change the luck of the team. So he <laughs> called over to Comiskey Park where he used to be the general manager for the White Sox. And he had them take that suit out that he wore during the celebration of the 1983 AL West division title. And it was soaked with champagne at the time. And it had shrunk to the point where it wouldn't <laughs> even fit me at this point. All right. So, but it had been under glass. This is the suit that Roland Heeman wore during the celebration. He put that suit on. It smelled terrible. It didn't fit anymore because <laughs> it had shrunk so badly. But this was his way of saying, all right, I'm going to try to switch our luck. I'm going to wear this suit. It didn't do any good. They want, they lost eight more games in a row. But only Roland Heeman would think, all right, I got to try something to reverse the fortunes of my team. I can't think of a better story to hone in on. Than that, that is the essence of Roland Heeman. Uh, Tim, when when you got the news that you were going into the Hall of Fame, tell us what did you first? What were your first thoughts, and who did you first think about? Well, it was kind of a bizarre story. I was really nervous on Tuesday morning, so I decided to kill some time and go to the Harris Teeter grocery store, which I like do every day. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I knew the announcement wasn't coming till noon. I figured I had until 1130 if I won before somebody's going to call me. So I went there and I was in the self-service checkout line at the Harris Teeter. And I was like <laughs> dragging bottles of water through the self-service line and i got a call from jack o'connell now i've been told that jack o'connell doesn't call you unless you win jack is the secretary treasurer of the baseball writers so i went oh my gosh so i kind of dropped the water on the ground i took the call he gave me the news and i don't mind telling you this i cried right in the middle of the harris theater <laughs> it was That's just funny. the most surreal experience ever so naturally i thought first of my father my father was the one that taught his three boys how to play the game. He died in 2003. He gave us all love for the game, a great feel for the game. 
And after thinking about him and my mother, who are the two most important people in the world, my mom died a year and a half ago. I drove over to my brother's house. He lives right around the corner from me. And he's 11 months older than me, born in the same year. So we're essentially close to twins. So I went over and gave him a big hug. And then I went home and hugged uh, the whole family, wife, children, everything else. So it was uh, it was quite an experience for me. And I can't even begin to tell you how powerful that was. Um, to borrow a line from Cal Ripken when he broke Lou Gehrig's record, I kept thinking, you know, this can't be happening to me. This has to be <laughs> happening to somebody else. But indeed, it was me. And it was quite an honor. Ross, go ahead. I know you. Yeah, yeah Timmy, you, you know, you go back, uh, you know, to uh, going to school in the area and, uh, you know, playing basketball at Rips and uh, the News American and all this other stuff. And uh, whammo, this happens. I know that had to be a well-deserved thing. I, as I said before, congratulations. Uh, I don't think people really know. Uh, you are so, uh, you're writing uh, you're so honest. Uh, the players respect you. They trust you. They want to talk to you. They're not shying away uh, because you're fair and honest. Now, how did you get started in writing? I know you played basketball and baseball growing up in high school. How did you get started in the writing? Well, I went to Walter Johnson High School, mm -hmm. named after the greatest pitcher of all time. And the first time I ever tried to write anything significant I was at the school paper at Walter Johnson because my high school basketball coach said you should you should write for the school paper the school paper of course was called the pitch uh, and uh, <laughs> I did some work for the yearbook it was called the wind up so quite honestly I got my start at a newspaper called the pitch at Walter Johnson High School. And I was a terrible writer in high school. In fact, after one story I wrote for the pitch, one of my gym teachers came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that might be the worst story I've ever read at the school <laughs> paper. And he said, I hope you're not planning on making this your life's work. And as it turns out, that's exactly what I did. But that's where I got the bug from. And when I graduated from Walter Johnson at like five, two and a half, 115 pounds. I knew my baseball and basketball careers weren't going much farther than that. So I just said, all right, I enjoyed writing. I stink at it, but maybe I can learn to get better at it because I have to somehow make a career out of baseball because really, frankly, and I'm not proud of this, the only two things I really loved beyond my family, of course, were baseball and basketball. So I said, right. baseball is my favorite sport. How in the world can I make a career out of this? And lo and behold, I did because eventually I learned how to write. Is that the, the guy that told you that you shouldn't write? Is he still around? No, he died a long time ago. Oh. But, but quite honestly, he was right because I was really bad back then. And I, I, I took that as a challenge. Like, if he thinks I'm yeah. this bad, I have to get better. And then after I graduated, like my senior year in college, my brother, Andy, who was a great college baseball player, by the way, and a PhD from MIT in engineering, okay, way, way, way smarter than me. He and my dad had a conversation at the dinner table, just the two of them. And Andy said to my dad, what is Tim going to do with his life? How in the world is he going to make a career out of baseball? No one could just make a career out of baseball. And my dad kind of looked at him and said, dad, don't worry, Tim will figure this out. So not everyone questioned, I'm mean, not everyone trusted me along the way and I don't blame him because I was this dinky little kid who wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do. But the one thing I had was an intense love for baseball and that has taken me a long way. You, you know, I will say this before Stan, uh, right. I, I will say this, the times I've been around you at the ballpark, you're there way earlier than anyone else you're uh, there afterwards you spend a lot of time uh early getting information that normally uh i, I think uh, i think players coaches managers are a little more open when they're just sitting around but you're out there early beating the pavement and uh trying to get is that something that uh uh that uh, you found that was uh, uh that you should have done or you wanted to do or you how did that come about 
Well, I didn't have a choice. There were other guys out there who were way better writers than me. There were other guys out there early on who were way more experienced than me. So I said, what's the only way I can compete here? I'm going to have to try harder than everyone else. So I tried hard. I can give you that. But but Ross, the point is, when I show up in the late, late 70s and early 80s to the ballpark, what it usually meant was I got I got to sit next to Earl Weaver on the bench and talk to him one on one about baseball. Frankly, right. who wouldn't show up early to do something like that? And, you know, I'd be wandering around the batting cage and there'd be all these great players and I'd get to talk to them. So here I am. I think I like and I love and understand the game, but every single player and manager I talked to made it more important that I was there. And that's why I showed up early and that's why I left late. There you incredible, go. incredible answer and, and insight into what it took to do what you did. So let me ask you a question. Who helped you hone your writing skills? Did you pattern your writing skills after someone? Was it somebody or a collection of guys or gals that took you under their wing? Uh, and, and when did you finally say, I finally am a pretty good writer? Well, I used to read Thomas Boswell of the Post growing up, and he's not that much older than me, but Thomas Boswell was and is a great writer, especially on baseball. Dan Shaughnessy of the, Glo of the Boston Globe was at the Washington Star when I was at the Washington Star. He, of course, was the baseball writer. Eventually, I became his backup, so I used to watch him right. I used to watch him report. I watched him how he did his job and I learned an enormous amount from him. He was one of the great mentors I've ever had. And then once I started covering every day, I, I became friends with Peter Gammons, who I believe is the greatest baseball writer of all time. And what he taught me and everybody else about how to write a game story, how to do daily notes, how to do Sunday notes, how to be a reporter and a writer. He was instrumental in me learning so much early on. And there have been so many more. Jason Stark of The, uh, of the Athletic now was a, another mentor to me. You know, he taught me so much about where to look for things, how to find things, even the quirkiest, silliest stuff, which I also love. So if I could pick out three guys, and I could probably pick out 30 of them, but those were three who had a lot to do with my career. And when did you finally feel confident in your abilities as a writer? not your knowledge of baseball. Was there a certain point where you sort of said, you know, I'm pretty comfortable in this. I'm pretty good at this. Well, after my first year covering the Rangers in 1982, so that was the first year I was the full-time beat guy, as opposed to the backup beat guy, which I was for a couple years. Once it's your job, it, it's like, you know, it's like you're the closer or you're you're the, the fifth starter or the number one starter. It's your job and it's your responsibility. After that year, even though I got my brains beat out on the beat because I still didn't know how to do the job, I, I started to figure out I, maybe I know how to write. Maybe I'm better than I think I am. But mostly I learned how to do the job, how to follow stories, how to get stories. First year was really difficult. And then I realized, okay, now I got to do a way better job collecting news. And I did that for almost 10 years on the beat. And I got better at that also. So like anything else, if you practice something hard enough, you get better at it. Ross, go ahead. You got a yeah, couple hey, now. Timmy, you, you missed the box scores and the uh, Sunday morning, uh, uh, who's leading in ERA and the batting averages. You miss all that. Yeah, um, you know, I grew up at a time where the Sunday paper had, we all know, had the, the, the leading hitters in each league. Now we have these sets of statistics you can't even follow. There's so many of them. But Sunday was like the greatest time to, lo to look in the, um, in, the, in the Sunday paper. Uh, as for box scores, I'm sure I told you guys this at one point. I cut out every box score of every game for a 20-year period and I, like I was in the seventh grade or something, but I was an adult when I did that. I had gone to Sports Illustrated. I'd become a national baseball writer, meaning I'm not just covering the Orioles anymore. I got 30 teams to keep my eye on. And the best way to do that was to cut out every box score of every game as I went along and taped them in my book. And I never missed a day 
in 20 years. That's that's quite a streak. I think that puts Cal Ripken's streak to shame if you really think about it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, one night about one, about 11.45, I'm asleep in bed and I, I, I bounce up and say, oh my God, I forgot to do my baseball scorebook today, my box scorebook. So I, I got up and ran in and cut everything out and taped it in my book. And I got back and my wife kind of looked at me like, cause she kind of knew where I'd gone. Like how could I marry such an unfathomable geek? But that's who I was and that's who I am. I still at age 65, love to get up in the morning and read the box scores. Cause you can learn so much from the box scores. It's un unbelievable. As a player, that was one of the most, to get up and see your name, if you did well, you know, or to see the Sunday and see where you ranked, uh, you know, in the top 10 or so. It was really, the, the players loved it too. Timmy, the uh, best interview you ever had, the best interview and the most difficult. Um, I think the best one was with Cal Jr. Because in the year that he broke Lou Gehrig's record, which was the story of the season, I'd gotten to know him really well, and he trusted me enough to let me go with him to places where others were not allowed. And he's one of the very few people that's ever allowed me to places like that. Like I drove to the ballpark with him. I drove home from the ballpark with him. I wanted to know what, what does he listen to on the way to the ballpark? What does he listen to on the way home? I went to his house. I went to his gym. I got to see him in action. I stood there while he signed autographs after the game for an hour and a half. And I must tell you, I don't think I wrote down live more than one page of notes. All I was there for was to hang out with him, observe him, talk to him and at the end of the day i wrote everything down what i had seen that day and i wrote like a 12-page story on cal ripkin because he gave me basically a week of his life and that might be the best story i've ever written because yeah. it was such an important story um the hardest interview i ever did well it wasn't even an interview <laughs> many, many years ago i wanted to do a story on the great young power hitters in baseball and I wanted to go talk to Albert Bell of the Indians because he was one of the best power hitters. And it was, it was purely a baseball story. No personality. I don't want to know about what you did before or after. I just want to talk to you about what a great hitter you are. So I called the Indians. The Indians said, Albert, will talk to you. So I showed, I flew 1500 miles to see Albert Bell. I go up to his locker. I introduce myself, tell him, look, uh, I was told you would talk to me. He goes, I'm not talking to you. And I said, why? He goes, well, you work for Sports Illustrated and anyone who talks to anyone from Sports Illustrated immediately goes into a slump, the SI jinx. Oh, so I, I thought he was kidding. And I kind of chuckle with him and he goes, I'm not kidding. I'm not talking to you. Get out of here. And then oh. I, I was shocked. I, so I said, I'll be here after the game to talk if you like. And he goes, didn't you hear me? I'm not talking to you. So I guess that qualifies as a difficult interview because it never really got started. <laughs> oh, yes. Tim, 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 let me jump to the point in which baseball, the, the, the electronic media became, you know, the internet and everything. When did the game, the coverage of the game, become so instantaneous and how did that change your routines well i'm not sure when the internet exactly started but 10 or 12 years ago we had an enormous shift in journalism in coverage and it, it's taken me and i'm still not there yet it's taken me a long time to make an adjustment to that because again i'm 65 years old i am terrible with technology I don't even, I have like 700,000 followers on Twitter and I don't even know how to use it. I'm afraid of it because I might make a mistake. So I think that's changed everything 
for this reason. Now there is a race to get every story. When I was at the Baltimore Sun, if you didn't have two good sources for your story, that story simply wasn't going to run. Now we don't need a source. Now we just throw it out there on Twitter and we're breaking it in 140 or 280 characters now. And I'm not very comfortable doing that. And some people are great at it and they're, they're very representative doing it. But we have too many people out there in my mind who want to get it first as opposed to getting it right. Plus the information is everywhere i mean there used to be a time where you see something really cool in the box score you look up a really cool statistic and you're the only one that has it now right. people all over the internet have it all the time so i have to work even harder to find something interesting something different something unusual so i've, I've had to work way way harder with the advent of the internet because it's every second there's another story out there uh, and back when I was covering the beat in Baltimore, if you had a story at midnight or 1159 on a Tuesday, that story lived essentially until Thursday morning because you couldn't get to it because of the daily deadlines. Now there are no deadlines. The whole process is is 24-7. It's 24-7. That's what I was alluding to. Yeah. A, lawyer, <laughs> a lawyer I talked to about 15 years ago told me we used to get like a brief would be mailed to us and we'd have we'd have a day or two to read it and then type out a response put it back in the mail but he said now today you get something sent to you by a client they're expecting you to re read it and respond that day there's no time off almost and it would seem like what you do is similar in a way to that right and the other thing that has really hurt you know, reporters and the newspaper business and all journalism is that the players, frankly, don't need us anymore. You know, when I worked at Sports Illustrated and you got a cover story at Sports Illustrated, that was a really big deal. When you, when you got asked to go on Sports Center or something like that, that was a really big deal 15 years ago. It's not that big a deal anymore because everyone has his own Twitter page. Everyone's got... <clears throat> all sorts of ways to get the word out without needing us. So that's made it more difficult also is the players to some degree have stopped talking to us, not because they hate us, but they can get their own message out without going through us, the middleman. And I don't frankly think that has helped the journalism business at all. And yeah. I, I think we can tell better stories than the players can themselves, but they're on their own. And I, I certainly understand why. Ross, go ahead. You got a couple. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, Timmy, we, I don't think we can, uh, we have to talk a little bit and just briefly, what is your thoughts on the lockout situation? Well, I'm really disappointed and I'm worried like everybody else out there because we didn't just get to December 1st without an agreement. We didn't even come close at December the 1st. And it worries me that we, there were some people in the game who looked at December 1st as, oh, it's not really a deadline. It's kind of an artificial deadline, which of course it is because nobody's losing any money right now. There are no games that are being lost, but this is still critical time for teams to start to get ready. And I'm fearful that a month is going to go by and no progress is going to be made. And we will have lost a month of the off season. This is not a good time for baseball to do that. So I'm still hopeful. I'm going to take the high road as usual and, and understand that there is so much money to be lost here without an agreement that eventually they will come to an agreement. And I think it will be done in order to get April 20, April 1st, 2022 off to the right start. And we're playing major league games, but if you go, if you don't have an agreement by the end of February, let's say, which is source told me the other day, that's where I'm going end of February. That's really going to put spring training in trouble and that's going to endanger the regular season. And this is not a good time to lose any games. Baseball has its own problems behind football and basketball and in some places, hockey, this is not a good time for a work stoppage for sure. How, da how damaging is this to baseball? 
Well, it could be really, Ross, because, but let me just say first, baseball is the greatest game in the world. And you guys know that because Stan, you love it. And Ross, you played it and you love it. Nothing will overcome baseball. It's too good of a game. It's overcome, baseball's overcome world wars and yeah. steroids and cheating scandals and everything else. And it always bounces back. But don't forget how long it took after 94, 95 for the game to really come back. If it weren't for Cal Jr., right. it would have taken much longer. If it weren't for Sosin McGuire in 98, it would have taken much longer. I'm just worried that with everything else going on in this in this world today, give me the, give me the stuff now. I need, I need my fix now. And baseball is lagging behind in a work stoppage. I'm not sure people are going to come back very quickly. Right. And that really worries me. But to repeat, I just have to think cooler heads are going to prevail here and say, fellas, we can't do this. There's too much money to be lost. And somehow, some way, they'll find a way to open on time. Tim, a question about analytics and what they've done to the game. Is there, is there a chance that the analytics have ruined the ability for fans to appreciate the game the way I did, the way you did, the way Ross did and played it, uh, that that somehow we don't have the secret sauce if we don't get the analytics, you know, if we're not mathematicians from MIT. Is, is there a chance that that has soured some people from loving the game? Yeah, and by the way, my father, my late father, was a mathematician from MIT. So I grew up in a, in a household where statistics were king. I'm worried though, we've gone way too far in that direction. And we've kind of stopped watching the games. And Ross will tell you that today's players are bigger, faster, stronger than ever. But do they really have an understanding of what they're doing out there? I'm not sure that they do. And I think the analytics have taken away the field for the game. I know we don't run the bases very well. We, we don't pitch with great intelligence certain nights. We don't hit the cutoff man as often as we used to. I think Earl Weaver would have thrown up his hands a million times <laughs> with the way the game is played today. But these players are so good. They just overpower the game with their physical gifts. But they don't truly, truly understand what it's like to understand what's going on on every pitch. That's the stuff that I love. And that's the stuff that has gone away to some degree. And now, frankly, it's just too many walks, too many strikeouts and too many home runs. Tim, uh, you're, you're deserving of this honor of going into the hall of fame as a writer quotation marks around the word writer. What part did ESPN and your ability to have sort of that kind of access over this last 15 years, what has that done for your position in the game? Well, I've been at ESPN 25 years it now. Is that long? Wow. Yes. And what it's done for me, Stan, is first off, I have written, I've never stopped writing. So I went yeah, on TV. I I went on TV right away, Baseball Tonight, my first year, 19, uh, 1998, uh, I was on TV right away. But what that did was it, you know, more and more people were watching TV, so I didn't always have that awkward uh, introduction to a player because they were all watching Baseball Tonight. We had two, uh, two hours every night, seven nights a week. So that took away that. And it really helped me get to know more and more players by doing more and more TV stories. And I always felt like my writing really helped me do television. In other words, yeah. being a beat writer taught me how to do television. Now, I was terrible at it early, and I still have a <laughs> terrible voice, and I look awful on TV. None of that's the <laughs> point. I learned from my beat writing days how to do you know, how to understand where the story is, how to get it, and how to present it. It's a different presentation on TV, but my beat writing days taught me how to do anything I could do on TV. So TV has been critical to what I, I've done in my career, but writing is the baseline. Writing is the reason I could do anything else, because learning to be a beat writer first was critical for me. I got one last, uh, I've got actually two questions. I'm going to ask one and I'll give Ross a couple and then we'll get you out of here. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and, and my question was, I don't know if you read Kenny Rosenthal's piece that he wrote for The Athletic on you, um, it, but it really brought, it brought it all home to me. It reminded me of the com camaraderie you had, yet competitiveness with Kenny and Richard Justice at a key time in Oriole baseball history. Do, does, has it hit you yet how much impact you've had on some of the younger people coming along and doing what you've done? Well, I'm not sure what kind of impact I have, but I can tell you that I well, read. You the, had if you read if you read this piece. Uh, well, Kenny I read Rosenthal. the story, and I was deeply moved by the yeah. story that Ken Rosenthal, who works for the competition, wrote yep. a story about me. I was moved by that. My daughter read it. She's 30 years old, and she started to cry. Uh, that that was those were my greatest years covering the Orioles for the Sun because I did it every single day. And the competition was so fierce. Ken Rosenthal is the best baseball writer in the country right now. Richard no Justice question. was and is a great baseball writer. And I'm going up against those guys every day. Talk about a competition. Talk about better, you better be on it. Otherwise you're gonna get your brains beat out on this beat. So I was really happy that Ken Rosenthal wrote what he wrote because that's a side of my professional life that some young people don't even know. They don't even know I was a beat writer, but I repeat, that was the bedrock of my entire career was learning how to do that, learning how to write on deadline. And uh, boy, we had some knockdown drag outs, the three of us, Richard, Ken and I, and yet we're still friends to this day, which I think is really healthy. Hey, before I turn you over to Ross for the last two questions, I got to ask you, is Buck Showalter going to get the Mets job? Well, note my hesitation on this. I'm never quite sure anymore in baseball, especially in the offseason and especially with the Mets. But yes, I think he's going to get the job. To me, he's the most qualified person for the job. He's exactly what they need. He needs to go in there and clean up some things tie up some things and I'm hopelessly in the tank for Buck Showalter. I, wor I worked with him for seven years at, at ESPN. I could tell you a thousand Buck Showalter stories and all of them are good because I've never met a more observant, uh, a more analytical and a more interesting baseball guy than him. The stuff I learned from him, we can go on and on. Uh, I think he's going to be the Mets manager by the end of the week. And I think he should be. And I've got my fingers crossed. Ross, you got one or two quick ones for. Yeah, for I got the. Uh, Tim, I, all this going on, is it has it set in yet that you're in the Hall of Fame? Well, I shouldn't <laughs> tell you guys this, but the the day after I was elected, at eight thirty in the morning, Johnny Bench called me at oh, my man. house. The greatest catcher of all time called me and said. Tim, um, welcome to the club. You're one of us now. Wow. It was unbelievable. Now, let's be clear. I'm not one of them, okay? I'm in a <laughs> wing in the Hall of Fame. I'm not a Hall of Famer, and I'm certainly not anywhere near Johnny Bench or any of the players who are in. But when he told me that, called me out of the blue. That's fantastic. I almost started to cry again. I mean, <laughs> it was so powerful that he would take the time to call me yeah. and tell me that. Uh, that was pretty cool. And I've heard from a few other Hall of Famers since then, and each one of those was really cool too. So I'm not sure, Ross, if it's sunk yeah. in, <laughs> but when Johnny Bench calls you less than 24 yeah. hours after you're elected, uh, you take notice. That's special. Hey, let, let me ask you one more question before Stan takes over. No, I'm just going to say goodbye, but go ahead. Bro. Okay, well, uh, when I get your autograph, are you going <laughs> to sign it? Tim Kirchin, <laughs> Hall of H O F, 2021, or no, no, why Rob, not? Oh, you, you got to do that. No, 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 no. <laughs> these these are the rules that the Hall will tell you. You are not a Hall of Famer. You have oh. a place in the Hall of Fame, but you are not a Hall of Famer, and. I believe that with all my heart. The hall, the reason we have jobs, me and Stan, is we covered the players like you, Ross. And when we cover the Hall of Fame players, we have jobs because of them. We are not them. It is their game. It's just a privilege for us 
to cover it. So no, you will, if you ever see me write Tim Kirkjian Hall of Fame 2022, <laughs> I, I want you to just punch me in the neck because <laughs> never. that's not, not allowed and I will never do that. Oh, buddy, it's, it's so well-deserved and it should have come a lot sooner. I mean, you are just, I, and again, I say the players respect you. They trust you that they'll talk to you. Most all the players do as the Hall of Famers have called you. And uh, I mean, your honesty and your fairness to what you write about them, it, it's so special. And like I said, well-deserved, my friend. Well, thank you very much, Ross. Thank you, Stan. I had a great time with this. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. And we'll hopefully we'll get you on sometime around when spring training is about to start. And let's keep our fingers crossed. Let me get my fingers crossed. I can't cross them <laughs> as well as I used to. Uh, Tim, thank you for spending this time with us tonight. Really yes, appreciate buddy. it. Thank you so much, Tim. Thanks All again, right. fellas. Enjoyed it. See you. All right. I'll be back Thursday evening with Don Marcus, formerly of the Baltimore Sun, now a writing teacher at American University. We're going to talk some American, we're going to talk some University of Maryland athletics. Thanks again to Ross Grimsley. Tim Kirkton. We'll see you down the road.